the 18th district where is that that's not brooklyn <laughs> not it. it is not brooklyn so the 18th congressional district is i live in newburgh new york which is right on the hudson river we're 60 miles north of manhattan so our congressional district is really the heart of the hudson valley where orange county dutchess county and a part of ulster county so just think manhattan the hudson river go straight up north and you're gonna roll right into the New York 18th. Now that's past Yonkers. That's oh yeah. Past Mount Vernon. Yep. <laughs> it's like, that's where uh, I'll be sure keeps telling us he's from. All right, so <laughs> the only thing I know about that area is Tawana Brawley. Mm. Okay, so tell us something about the 18th district and why you wanna represent them. So Tawana Brawley was from Newburgh which is where I live. And you know what's interesting about just the history of policing here and, and the history of gun violence and the history of crime is that there was a moment in time um, where Newburgh, New York was considered the murder capital of the state of New York. And I'll tell y'all that while statistics may be what they were, the truth is, is that parts of my region, Newburgh being an example of it, um, have become a poverty economy that have been left behind by the systems that have helped to enrich folks who move out of the city and come up and you know want to buy million dollar homes um, and, and have left the people of the Hudson Valley behind. That is just one small piece of it. Um, the big part of New York 18 and why I'm running is because we are literally the heart and soul of the economy of the state when it comes to agriculture. Um, we are where manufacturing in New York uh, began. We are this beautiful region and community of hardworking people who are middle class that are seeing the prices of homes escalate all around us. The rents are impossible. Um, our schools are okay and good, but teachers, you know, are having a really tough time and starting to dip out of, of teaching. We have a, a healthcare workforce that's taxed. And so I'm running because it's about time that we actually put the people and the workers and the families of our community back into the politics. And for so long, we have had a national conversation and, you know, that has left us behind. And as the person who's always been an advocate for the people, who's been a champion of women, for sure, of people, People of color um, and, and LGBT communities, I'm here to be the people's congresswoman uh, and to make sure that our voices are amplified in Washington because everything that's happening is so consequential that we don't get canceled. We can't be canceled. We can't be silenced that we get to have a, a voice and a choice in this process. So I'm running because for 20 years, all I've done is, is serve and lift up people. And now that we have an open seat in New York 18. This is an open seat. My Congressman Sean Patrick Maloney is vacating it to run below us uh, in his new home, um, in his new home district. So it's an open seat. And I raised my hand uh, to offer myself to the community because I think I'm the best choice uh, to lead us down in Washington. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how it's done. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Mitchell, she, no stopping. Dr. Mitchell, uh, you got a question? Thank you. So first of all, Aisha Mills, what an honor to be in conversation with you. Your work with the Center of American Progress has definitely influenced my scholarship. When I compare uh, lynching in earlier decades to anti-LGBT violence now. So thank you for your long history of doing this work. What strikes me about what you just said about this campaign though is the language of poverty economy, the fact that you're making it very clear what is at stake. And to call it a poverty economy is to do precisely what our so-called polite discourse discourages us from doing. So your clarity is a gift to us all that we all need to be um, following your example and calling these things exactly the kind of violent processes that they are. And I guess my question for you is, um, you know, what, what has been some of the response to your clarity? Um, and what are the different ways that people have been supportive or not supportive as you've been doing this important work? 
Yeah, well, thank you so much for that. And, and thank you for um, the nod to, to the fact that I have been doing the work and thinking about intersectionality and frankly, drafting policy um, and, and proposing legislative ideas for many, many years. And that's also why I'm offering myself to the people as somebody who knows how to go to Washington and do the work on day one, because it's, the, it's what, I, what I've done. And I think about the structural isms to your point about, you know, how is that landing here? Well, the truth is, is that there are a whole lot of people in our communities here in the New York 18 that are frustrated and angry about the Supreme Court dialing back Roe versus Wade. There are a lot of women who are really, really pissed off that there are a group of folks, a handful of folks, um, largely men, who think that they can legislate our bodies, right? That they can make, they can get in the way of decisions that we make with our doctors, right? Like we, we, we shouldn't be beholden to some people that we don't even know who think that they can get into our personal business. There's no time for mincing words around that anymore. Yes. I get the niceties and the politeness, but the way that I am being received is I'm saying, look, I wanna be a problem solver and I wanna be your collaborative Congresswoman. So let's work together to think about the solutions we need to put forward to solve problems. But at the end of the day, in order to solve problems, we've got to actually articulate what they are and not be afraid to call out the various structural inequalities that are leaving working families behind, right? That are suppressing parts of this community. And it's not simply about um, race uh, or the, 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 the communities that have traditionally been marginalized in this country, which is everybody except for cis white men, right? It's not simply that. We are absolutely experiencing an economic crisis where people who used to be able to afford to live and used to be able to uh, be able to afford to send their kids uh, to camps and to send their kids uh, to college are struggling just to pay their utility bills right now. So there's no time for the niceties and the mincing words around the real crisis that we're facing. And look, I'm up against it. When, when I win this primary, I'm going to be facing off with a crazy Trumper who is a January 6th insurrectionist, who is a QAnon conspiracy theorist, who since sent busloads of people down to DC for the January 6th insurrection, trying to kidnap Nancy Pelosi. That's what we're up against. And so we've got to be really clear about the consequences of not engaging and the, the consequences of not participating. And, and, and the last thing I'll share with y'all, because we're, you know, this is family here in this conversation. You know, what I have been shockingly up against is the establishment. What has been interesting as somebody who has literally for the last 20 years, as you noted, worked in and around the Democratic establishment and helped to elect hundreds of Democrats all around this country and to drive federal policy with Democrats, it has been really interesting to me that so there's been a, a good deal of ballot um, access blockage that's been happening. My opponent tried to block me from the ballot by suing to essentially try to uh, disqualify me when I wow. stepped into the race. Um, there's a, which, which is also a voter suppression that's happening on our own side here, trying to keep the more than 1500 people that signed petitions and, and support me from actually having a voice and a choice in this election. And so the, 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 the piece that I'm sadly not shocked about but always disappointed about is that it be our own people, as they say, you know, the old African American adage, um, <laughs> sometimes that do the most um, disservice to us being able to solve problems. Uh, and so, you know, we're we gonna move on from that. It's all right, because at the end of the day, this is a people powered campaign and the people of the Hudson Valley are speaking and saying, Aisha, we want you to go and be a champion and a fighter and a warrior for justice for us because we're tired of the milk toast backroom dealing of the good old boy club that kind of, you know, shakes hands across the aisle and pretends that that's somehow going to protect our wounds, that they pretend that somehow, you know, doing business with the Republicans is going to safeguard our immigrant community that's here. We're not going to do that. And we're not going to pretend to do that in order to gain votes. We're actually just going to truth tell and, and, and offer it to the people and, and see if they believe in what we believe. And I think they do. Um, Aisha Mills is here, candidate for Congress, New York's 18th district. Six months ago, you were behind a desk, Black News Channel, you, you know, hosting a show. Yep. Um, Byron Allen has bought it out of bankruptcy. Did you decide to run while you were still there? Um, what was the impetus? And what's the process because there's so many people listening right now that want to do something and i'm always saying pick up your baton pick up your like let's get busy 
Don't complain about it, get in a race and do something. And running for office is one of the things people can do. So what brought you into this race and would you still be here if you were behind that desk? Yeah, thank you for that question, Karen. That's, that's a good one that I need to talk more about. So first thing to, um, to answer the, the, the first part of your question, go to Aisha Mills for Congress or just AishaMills.com, either one, AishaMills.com, check me out. You can go, you can donate there. That's the first thing you can do if you don't live in New York 18, donate. Second thing you could do if you live anywhere nearby. And like I said, I'm only a quick little, you know, hour and a half ride from Manhattan. Come on up and volunteer. We need bodies to hit doors. And then the third thing that you can do is always amplify um, the race online. And the, the fourth thing is make sure people vote. Voting begins on August 13th. Election day is on August 23rd. To this piece about the Black News Channel, Karen, the truth is, is that the experience of the, what I'll call the demise of the Black News Channel has in part radicalized me to step up to the plate right now in this moment in time. We got trumped at BNC. Um, what happened there is that the billionaire who owned the network just decided that they were finished funding, fun, you know, funding the network. And without notice, we got an email on a Thursday that said, we're not gonna make payroll on the Friday. And 250 something, mostly black and brown employees of a major uh, cable news network were suddenly not only not gonna get paid for the work that they had done, but then out on the street unemployed. And the billionaire got to file bankruptcy, wash his hands of it and walk off into the fall on the backs of 250 people and workers. And I, and I say this this way because, you know, sure, I got my big break and had, you know, the biggest, coolest opportunity of my career by being able to be a primetime host. So there's privilege there, absolutely. I'm a privileged person from that, that network, but I'm a working person with three kids. I'm not an independently wealthy person that can just like say, oh, look at me, I don't have a job. And I very much, you know, I had a team of 12 people that had to pay their rent coming up on the first, and then got a notice on the 27th that they weren't even gonna get a paycheck. So would I be running in this race to answer your question if I still had that job? Well, the truth is, Karen, is that this wasn't a race when I had that job. Because of redistricting in New York, this seat just became open about eight weeks ago when our Congressman decided he wasn't running for re-election. And the blessing of how the universe um, kind of opens up time and space is that I was recently unemployed and had been behind the scenes fighting, trying to get our people the pay that they're deserved, right? Having been trumped and recognizing the consequence of what happens when we have an, an entire economy where billionaires run amok and they build and collapse things on the backs of people. And so when this seat came up, I knew that I needed to call to, to, to answer the call to jump into this, to fight on behalf of all these working people that are in my community, all the people that I have worked with, myself, who shares the same experience of what's happening uh, with workers who are treated without dignity or respect uh, in our country. And so the timing all just came together. The truth is, is that what I did at BNC, and thank you for, for, for lifting that up, is my show was called Amplified. Because what I have always done with every platform that I have had the, the real privilege to, to, to leverage and be a part of, either through my political work or through my policy work at a think tank or through my media work, is that I have always tried to amplify voices of people who aren't always heard in the political process and to try to inspire more people to participate in our democracy. Amplified was that this campaign becomes the next level uh, of that. So no matter what you know, is happening, we're gonna win this primary, but at the end of the day, what I am attempting to do always is to make sure that the voices are heard of the people who get marginalized and kind of canceled out of our political discourse and our policy conversations. And that's why this is a campaign that is all for and about the people.